Welcome back to Marxist Voice, podcast of the revolutionary communists in Britain. This episode, we'll be listening to another talk from 2023's Revolution Festival, this time on the crimes of British imperialism. The history of the British Empire is littered with horrendous crimes. From the partitions of India and Ireland, to the suppression of the Mau Mau uprising, and to its murderous role in the Easter Rising and Bloody Sunday, a list of all of the brutalities of the British Empire would take more than one episode. Many brave anti-imperialists have fought and died for the cause of expelling the British from their countries, and it's our duty to learn from this history. But despite this, the legacy of empire lives on, as does British imperialism, though in a very degenerate and pathetic form. Today, many former colonies are still struggling to break free from the economic and political backwardness imposed upon them by the British state. In this episode, Sarah Vedrovich will discuss the rise and fall of the British Empire and the heroic attempts to fight back against British colonial troops, opening up the arsenal of historical lessons which must be absorbed if we are to overthrow imperialism and capitalism today. Without further ado, this episode of Marxist Voice, brought to you by the communists in Britain. The problem is not that we were once in charge, but that we are not in charge anymore. Boris Johnson, 2020. What Britain brought to their countries was remarkable, and I get very saddened by this apology and shame promulgated by the left and commenced by the collective guilt that started under Tony Blair that is pervading our society. Suella Braverman, 2022. Too much of history teaching is informed by post-colonial guilt. Michael Gove, 2016. Okay, well, let's put to the test Gove's claims in this room. Uh, of those people here who went to British schools, who was actually taught about the British Empire? Put your hand up if you were taught about the British Empire at all. Okay, already very small. Um, out of those people, uh, keep your hand up if you were taught about the brutal oppression of the Mau Mau. Okay, put your hand, keep your hand up if you were taught about uh, the Armistice Massacre. Okay, what about Bloody Sunday or the Easter Rising? Nope. Two people, two people in the room were talking about them. Okay, so clearly far from Gove's slanderous claims, the history of the British Empire is, is rarely taught in schools. And where it is, we are taught that we ended slavery first, that we brought railroads to India, and that we civilized barbarous peoples of other lands. This question provides a perfect culture war talking point for the Tories, who can spit feathers at the idea that the left is taking away our right to be proud to be British, but increasingly, people, especially young people, are questioning the real role of, that the British Empire played and drawing the conclusion that it was not a progressive force, but a blood fueled murderous force, drawing the correct conclusion that the British Empire wiped out peoples and cultures, that it robbed and looted from their lands, that it raped and murdered locals, all for the sake of their own profits. So the way that the British Empire is taught to us here in Britain is a deliberate attempt to shut down any real understanding of the interests of the British ruling class and the murderous lengths that they will go to to get this. Because ultimately their interests haven't changed and the heinous acts which they will commit to achieve them have not lessened. To have millions of workers and youth understanding not just the crimes of the British Empire, but why those crimes were committed this would be disastrous for the ruling class. Well, it is the job of communists, the job of Marxists, to tell the truth on this matter, not simply on the crimes that were committed, but on why and how we stop these crimes being repeated once and for all. The history of British imperialism is a brutal one, and I'll include in this talk an explanation of some very brutal events, because it is impossible to tell the truth about the British Empire without this. So in order to understand the British Empire, we first have to go back to the basics uh, of Marxist theory on imperialism. So if you listen to the media, to academia, to the politicians on this matter, you could be convinced that empire was a choice made by either you know, great British heroes or evil villains, depending on which side of the debate you fall on. Yet this explains precisely nothing, because how did tiny Britain take control of one sixth of the world? Was it simply the great willpower of the British people or their murderous bloodlust? As Marxists, we understand that it was none of this that allowed Britain to conquer so decisively. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx says that capitalism must nestle everywhere and establish connections everywhere. 
When capitalism is growing too big for its national borders, it must smash through these borders, conquering and exploiting new markets. As British capitalism grew, so too did its need to spread as far across the world as possible, ravaging resources and extracting vast wealth. Britain was one of the first countries to have its own bourgeois revolution, developing capitalism most thoroughly on this island. And capitalism, as we understand it, is a more developed, stronger economic system than what came before it. It managed to conquer the world because of its ability to wipe out the feudal way of living. The growth that capitalism demands, unending and infinite growth to profits, that cannot be contained within the borders of the British Isles. It cannot be contained within any borders. So the expansion of British capitalism created the British Empire and the horrors which can be attributed to it. Britain grew rich off the back of this imperialism, uh, using the wealth it had created from exploiting its own working class here in Britain to exploit farther and wider than before, and then using the wealth it created through this imperialism to exploit and oppress its own working class uh, more thoroughly. So in this discussion, I don't have time to explain every crime of the British Empire. This would be an unending and very depressing task. Um, but I will try and use this time to discuss the interests that lay behind these heinous acts and why capitalism must be cast into the dustbin of history to avoid these atrocities in the future. So I want to begin with the use of Ireland in the growth of British capitalism. Ireland, I'll come back to continually through this discussion. Because being England's first colony, the ruling class here learned most of its important lessons about how to rule in Ireland. So English landlords had ruled over the Irish people for many years, but the real conquest of Ireland came with the rise of English capitalism. And I think it is worth kind of just stopping here and making a point about the way colonization is discussed today, because colonization is often discussed as a question of race, that there is something you know, inherent in the white skin that leads it to, uh, that leads it to colonize, or there is something inherent in non-white skin that leads it to be colonized. But the colonization of Ireland disproves this immediately. Imperialism and colonization is a natural product of capitalism uh, and the nation state. If racism can be used to cement the rule of a country, it will. And it was done with the Irish, you know, despite having skin tones almost identical uh, to that of the British. Racism is a useful tool of the imperialists and the colonizers, not the other way around. So as English capitalists saw it, Ireland was their back garden. Here was a wealth of agriculture which could be used to feed British troops and a labor force whose prices were as low as they could possibly be. And Cromwell's conquest of Ireland was a brutal process, killing somewhere between 15 and 50% of the population. Um, the war then resulted in a famine. And as well as this, many Irish were sent to North America or the Caribbean as indentured servants, causing an even further drop in the population. Whole villages were wiped out and the profits of the English capitalists were put before the people of Ireland at every single turn. In the famine of 1740, the price of Irish meat was deliberately suppressed to stop the English workers demanding wage rises, which led to Irish farms becoming unprofitable for the Irish. This, of course, led to more misery, more poverty and suffering for the Irish people. Capitalism, as Marx said, came into the world dripping from head to foot from every pore with blood and dirt. And this can be seen clearly here in Ireland. One of the most important uses of Ireland for the profit, uh, profits of the English ruling class was the use of cheap Irish labor in England. So Irish immigrants were brought across uh, the Irish Sea to Liverpool and Manchester. There are descendants of some of these immigrants uh, in this room, I know. Um, they were brought across the Irish Sea uh, and they were paid less than a pittance uh, to work in the factories. So whole Irish families were given either one bed or uh, a heap of dirty straw and old sacks to cover them. And inspectors found many homes with 16 people crowded into two rooms. One room they would sleep in and the other they would eat in. Often animals were put into the houses as well, which of course uh, increased the chances of illness and infection. So the price of Irish labor was of a great benefit to the English capitalists who not only used Irish labor to keep their costs low, but used it to push down the price of the local workers. 
So Samuel Holm, let's take the word of the capitalists on this. You, know, you don't have to listen to me on this. We'll take the word of this guy, Samuel Holm. He was a capitalist in Liverpool uh, at this time. And he explained this really, really clearly, I think. He said, I consider the Irish are of great value to the town. If it were not for the influx of them, the almost unlimited number of them at our command, and their willingness to do the dirtiest and meanest work, the wages of common labour would rise considerably. So here we can really see the use of the Irish people uh, to the English capitalists. Capitalism is concerned with one thing, how to make the greatest profits possible. However brutal, however criminal, capitalism will continue this brutality for the sake of profits as long as it remains. This means, of course, that defenders of capitalism must obfuscate the truth. They must ignore the heinous crimes uh, for the sake of defending Britain. And one example of this that I mentioned before is this uh, idea that we are taught so often about how Britain was the first country to abolish slavery. Yet we are rarely taught about how Britain grew fat on the spoils of slavery. So unlike the US, Britain did not make its primary wealth from slaves on its shores but it made unfathomable profits carrying slaves from Africa to the Americas. Britain and Portugal between them uh, were responsible for 70% of Africans sold into slavery. The people of West Africa before this had previously lived lives of farming, of fishing, of making pottery. But with the emergence of Britain and Africa, we now see people traded in exchange for whiskey, for gunpowder, for silk beads, for wool, cotton and linen. And often one bottle of whiskey would be traded for 40 slaves. Uh, So low was the the price of this labor. The local people were wrenched out of their homes and they were brought to uh, what is referred to as barracoons uh, by the shore. And these were the lowest living conditions, you know, harsher than ghettos with families sleeping on hay on the cold ground. British involvement in the slave trade was not short-lived. This was not a blip in, uh, in the British Empire. It lasted in the main from 1640 to 1807. And I would really recommend our article, uh, How British Capitalism Grew Rich Through Slavery, uh, to kind of further understand this topic, as well as to understand why the uh, British abolished slavery, which, you know, as I'm sure comrades can imagine, was not a moralistic uh, decision from the British ruling class. So slavery and the plunder of Africa in general, it provided a lucrative opportunity for the British capitalists. British capitalism conquered and exploited too much of the world to discuss even a fraction of the crimes in depth. But I think it is worth also mentioning the role that Indian colonization played in the development of British capitalism and the empire. So in the Powys Castle in Wales, has anyone been to the Powys Castle in Wales? one person. Um, In the Powys Castle in Wales, there's a painting of the last Mughal prince handing over control of India to Robert Clive. Now this painting shows a happy ceremony of two harmonious parts kindly swapping control of India. But in reality, this painting was produced by a man called Benjamin West, who had never been to India. And uh, commentators even speculated that the mosque seen out of the window in the painting was strikingly similar to St. Paul's Cathedral down the road. (laughs) And this is because Benjamin West had literally never seen a mosque. He said, oh, I've heard that they're round and St. Paul's is round. Let's do that, you know. Um, So this depiction of uh, of a friendly exchange of power, this was far from the truth and amounted to nothing more than propaganda of the British Empire. The East India Company at the time was the largest company in the world, with its own military force twice the size of the British military, numbering 260,000 soldiers. So when the East India Company was created, the group set their aims as, as being to venture in the pretended voyage to the East Indies, the which it may please the Lord to prosper. So they invested the equivalent of four million pound in today's money, and they spent it on traveling to India and looting as much as possible. In fact, they stole so much from India that the word loot itself is stolen from the Hindi language, uh, meaning the spoils of war. So the British went there and we stole so much that hundreds of years later, we still use the Hindi word for stealing. Um, A year after originally setting out their goals, the heads of the East India Company met again, and they asked Queen Elizabeth I for her blessing to monopolize the East Indies or India. 
And she granted this, and the East India Company worked to extract as much profit from India as possible. So far from this painting in the Powys Castle, the takeover of India was not a gentle process. Um, and in the diaries of uh, one senior official of the old Mughal regime, uh, he wrote, Indians were tortured to disclose their treasures. Cities, towns, and villages were ransacked. Jagiers and provinces purloined. These were the delights and the religions of the directors um, and their servants. So Robert Clive was made the richest man in Europe from the East India Company. And the company ruled over India for 100 years until the British crown took over direct rule and established the first Raj. Both company rule and crown rule were brutal and bloody for India. But for the British capitalists, these were some of the most profitable endeavors in history. So of course, no wonder the British state was happy to support this. When people are colonized and pushed into oppression, struggle against this always emerges. People do not often lie down and accept their new rulers without response. Therefore, the British ruling class knew that it must quickly learn the best ways to rule people. So the main lesson that they learned was the power of divide and rule. People of different religions, of diff different ethnicities, of different tribal backgrounds, they were pitted against each other uh, and their lands were carved up, splitting up families and communities, all in pursuit of pointing anger away from the British imperialists. And this was no secret. In fact, Lord Elphinstone said of India, divide et empara, divide and conquer, was an old Roman maxim and it shall be ours. So in India, people who had been living together in harmony for generations were divided and pitted against each other. In the 19th century, religious divides were minimal in India with traditions and languages and cultures cutting across all of these religious divisions. And during the rebellion of 1857 against company rule in India, Muslims and Hindus had fought alongside each other against the East India Company. So in 1858, the British Crown took control of India. They said clearly the, uh, the power of the East India Company is waning. Um, and as they did this, they carried out this plan of divide and conquer. The British vowed that they would create enough animosity between Muslims and Hindus that they would never fight alongside each other again. So when a semblance of voting rights was grudgingly granted in India, the British created separate communal electorates for Muslims um, so that they could vote for Muslim candidates in Muslim seats and vice versa for Hindus. And the British financially supported political leaders who campaigned for a separate Muslim homeland. They raised the Muslim League to a point of real prominence amongst Muslims in India. But the problem with divide and rule tactics is that division often gets out of hand. Once you have uh, rubbed the lamp hard enough to get the genie of sectarianism to arrive, it is very difficult to put that genie away again. So violent sectarianism emerged in India with brutal consequences. Gangs of killers set whole villages aflame. People, including children, were hacked to death and women carried off and raped. British soldiers and journalists who had witnessed Nazi death camps claimed that the horrors committed in this sectarian divide were worse. Pregnant women had their breasts cut off, babies were hacked from their stomachs, and infants were roasted on spits. So from living together across India in harmony, within a hundred years of divide and rule, this level of dehumanization was created. And as violence got worse, more and more people who had lived uh, happily in harmony uh, alongside people of other religions were given a sectarian consciousness. So divide and rule had worked. It had successfully pitted Muslims against Hindus um, and distracted from the burning question uh, of hatred of British rule. However, sectarianism was now making it difficult to directly rule in India, especially as Britain was now struggling to find the money that it needed to rule after the war. So now it made much greater sense to remove direct control over India and establish a friendly government which would allow Britain to take financially from India everything which it once had without having to expend the time and the money on actually ruling over it. So Lord Mountbatten, the last Viceroy of India, told the Indian people that the British would leave in 10 weeks and a safe homeland would be created for both Muslims and Hindus. <laughs> 
And he gave the job of partition to a man called Cyril Radcliffe. Of course, he you know, didn't care at all about uh, a safe homeland for either of these people. It was his family, his aristocracy, which had done this in the first place. Uh, but he gave this job to a man called Cyril Radcliffe, who had never been to India. In fact, he had never even traveled east of Paris. So Cyril Radcliffe drew a line on a map uh, in a country that he knew nothing about. And then he uttered some very uh, on the nose words saying, there will be 80 million people who are unhappy with what I have done. He burnt his papers that he'd used to mark the division and he never looked back. But in this process, he sent people running, uh, trying to make Pakistan if they were Muslim and India if they were Hindu. People took treacherous journeys across the subcontinent, uh, dodging gangs of thugs along the way. People left their friends and their communities in order to stay safe. And many people who have now lived through partition, they show uh, like rocks, um, just rocks from the street, uh, from the homes and villages uh, that, they, uh, that they once lived in, because this is all that they have left of the community that they once considered home. And partition, of course, only entrenched the sectarianism that the British created. They ran from the land that they had divided, leaving behind a million dead, 17 million displaced, billions in property damage done, and a sectarianism which is still raging on today. So this is a telegraphic overview of the events in India, but even this shows us the shallowness of this idea that Britain civilized the colonies. Barbarism was entrenched in India by the British. In Ireland, a very similar process took place. Ireland, as Britain's first colony, was the testing ground for many of these lessons that the British would learn. The British deliberately used the British deliberately used sectarian division to rule uh, Ireland for centuries. So as far back even as the 17th century, there was a mass expulsion of Catholics from Ulster, which is what we now know as the North, um, and they were replaced with Protestant farmers uh, from Scotland and England, who the British thought would create a strong base of support for their rule on the island. Catholics were deliberately oppressed by the British to create animosity between Catholics and Protestants. And Protestants were given uh, better skilled jobs in shipyards and engineering. To the point that by 1911, less than 10% of workers in shipbuilding were Catholic and around 11% in engineering. And this is despite one third of Belfast's population being Catholic at the time. The Orange Order was supported and maintained by the British because the British knew that this drove down the labor prices everywhere and distracted from their own rule. Ramsay MacDonald uh, explained this very clearly when he said this. He said, in Belfast, you get labor conditions the likes of which you get in no other town. No other city of equal commercial prosperity from John O'Groats to Land's End or from the Atlantic to the North Sea. It is maintained by an exceedingly simple device. Whenever there is an attempt to root out sweating in Belfast, the orange big drum is beaten. So what he's saying is when a fight to increase the standard of living was fought, the Orange Order fought against it because it would improve the conditions for Catholics. And this was indescribably useful to the British ruling class. But in spite of this, in spite of all of these sectarian divisions that had been whipped up and created, a real class struggle could still cut across this divide. So in 1907, Jim Larkin, the revolutionary trade union leader, led a mighty strike amongst the dock workers, including both Protestant and Catholic workers. And the bosses tried to beat the orange drum around July 12th, but they failed to break this strike. Uh, the crisis around the question of home rule for Ireland was brewing and brewing, and British Parliament were kind of forced to discuss this. But they knew one thing for certain, they did not want to lose control of Belfast. Belfast was the most economically developed part of Ireland with 21% of Ireland's industry. So the solution then was to use this sectarianism, which they had been whipping up for centuries, to keep a hold of the most economically developed parts of Ireland in the North. <coughs> because Belfast was majority Protestant, hatred of home rule was further developed here. In 1912, as the British Parliament discussed Home Rule, Lord Carson, with the help of the Tory party, organized a unionist militia to stop Home Rule. Money and resources were plunged into the creating of the Ulster Volunteer Force, a reactionary mob which Lenin likened to the Black Hundreds in Russia. And they were armed with 25,000 rifles. <coughs> 
Further fear was created amongst Protestants with the slogan, home rule is Rome rule. Essentially, if you have an independent Ireland, Protestants will be outnumbered um, and therefore oppressed by Catholics. And you can see why Protestants would believe this, given the oppression uh, that was happening uh, on the Catholics, um, uh, who were the outnumbered force in the north. Uh, this opened up a tumultuous period of revolution and counter-revolution in Ireland. In 1921, the British government divided Ireland, creating a state based only in sectarianism in the north. And the creation of Northern Ireland has, of course, led to a century of bloodshed. This century of sectarian violence is nothing natural to the Irish people. This was deliberately cre created within Ireland by the British ruling class. Upon divide, the Northern Irish state terrorised Catholics with the complete backing of British imperialism. In 1922, 450, so a year after that happened, uh, 450 people had been killed in violent pogroms and a quarter of Belfast population had been driven from their homes. The lessons of divide and conquer were absolutely invaluable to the British Empire, who used this from corner to corner. In Sri Lanka and Nigeria, this divide and rule was also used. So understanding the lessons which our enemies, the imperialists and the ruling class have learned is vital for us in understanding that there is nothing natural or everlasting about these divisions uh, fostered in the colonies. As I explained at the start of this introduction, the ability of a capitalist country to become imperialist is based on its economic strength. We should not kid ourselves that any capitalist country around the world, which has existed uh, across history, would not act in a brutal imperialist manner if it had the chance. If we accept that imperialism is a natural part of capitalism, the highest stage of capitalism, as Lenin said, then we also accept this. But this understanding can therefore lay out to us why the British Empire crumbled. The special crisis of British capitalism is not a new phenomenon, but has been raging on for over a century, with the real productivity of British labour stagnating or falling since then. Between 1790 and 1890, so the peak of British imperialism, real GDP per capita more than doubled in Britain. And we had, uh, the British capitalists had a 33% edge on the USA and a 70% edge on France and Germany. And this is what allowed British imperialism to carve up and exploit the world how it wished. However, we see the truth here in Marx's favourite quote, that all that exists deserves to perish. Because the curse of being the first country to develop capitalism to such a high level began to hit Britain. And its imperialist meddling turned into its opposite. British industry was old and tired, based on the earliest machinery and had not been updated. And growing fat from the spoils of imperialism had also damaged the productivity of British capitalism with money and resources being redirected to the colonies as the capitalists knew they could exploit these workers more and make higher profits. So by the 20th century, British capitalism was beginning to struggle. And other countries which had come later to capitalism, they had newer machinery, they had more developed methods, and they were not tied to the old colonies. So first we see Germany flexing its muscles, looking to compete with British imperialism, especially in Africa. And in this, we see the origins of the First World War. The epoch that we are living in today mirrors this in a lot of ways, with conflict and wars worldwide because of a changing balance of imperialist forces. Secondly, American imperialism came onto the scene. The USA used the war in Europe to boost its own place in world relations. Because with bombs dropping 3,000 miles away from the USA, they could realize every economic benefit of war without any damage to the infrastructure or labor force. So between 1914 and 1919, British debt grew from uh, 650 million to 7.4 billion, with the US being the main creditor of this debt. And America therefore took its place as the dominant imperialist power as Britain began to drift towards becoming a second rate power in world relations. It no longer had the ability to manage the colonies and political unrest at home was on the horizon because of the damaged economy. As the crisis of British capitalism worsens, the empire began to crumble. 
Britain lost India and there were calls for independence across the rest of the empire. And now the situation at home was dire. The British ruling class cynically tried to retain its position on the world stage. After the Second World War, Britain needed to be rebuilt and movements at home were demanding a higher living standard and better wages, which would have meant a loss to profits for British capitalism. It was on the basis of this that the Labour government lifted the immigration controls passed, uh, and passed the British Nationality Act of 1948. This act gave those living in the Commonwealth UK citizenship. Essentially, what it was, was the British government going cap in hand to the colonies and saying, please rebuild the country for us. Quickly, it became clear that this would not just be white workers from Australia or Canada or New Zealand, but it would bring in workers from across the Commonwealth. So the British ruling class schemed about how to use this to their advantage and realized that workers from Africa and the West Indies provided a super exploitable source of labor. Businesses began to exclusively hire workers from these places, even paying for their trips to Britain. These workers were paid much lower wages, allowing the ruling class to increase their profits. And racism was used in a direct attempt to continue this. So a concerted campaign was begun to scapegoat black workers arriving in Britain. The Bosses Press talked, uh, talked about the attacks on British values and the coloured problem. Uh, the British state supported these attacks, talking of slow black workers to justify the horrific treatment of them. One Whitehall report even spoke of the irresponsibility, quarrelsomeness and lack of discipline of the black workers. So, of course, this concerted effort by the bosses and the state led to rampant racism and xenophobia, leading to race riots, to police brutality and to endless hate crimes against black people. All of the lessons that the British ruling class had learned at home, uh, about, uh, had learned uh, abroad about divide and conquer, um, they now used at home. Underpay black workers, keeping wages low overall, and point the anger of white workers away from you by scapegoating black workers. Divide et empire. British capitalism may have been declining and the empire may have been crumbling. But this only made the British ruling class all the more brutal in its attempt to keep whatever financial gains uh, could be secured from the remnants of the empire. The treatment of black workers in Britain was one way to do this. And another was the continuation of financial domination in the colonies becoming independent. Imperialism, as we can see from American imperialism, does not necessarily require direct rule by an imperialist country. The US, of course, has grown strong off the back of economically uh, exploiting countries that it has never claimed to rule over. As James Connolly, the famous Marxist in Ireland said, if you remove the English army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle, unless you set about the organization of the Socialist Republic, your efforts will be in vain. England will still rule you. She would rule you through her capitalists, through her landlords, through her financiers, through the whole array of commercial and individualist institutions she has planted in this country and watered with the tear of our, tears of our mothers and the blood of our martyrs. So on the fall of the empire, Britain tried to place into power as many friendly governments as possible. And there are many examples that I could discuss here, but I think clearly the example with the most uh, brutal outcome is the Mau Mau in Kenya. And the stories from this event uh, are some of the most awful to hear. So the Mau Mau were a guerrilla army trying to fight British colonization. Um, and when the Mau Mau uprising took place, the British already had a plan to leave Kenya and grant it formal independence. However, the rise of the Mau Mau would have left Britain with little ability to financially exploit Kenya. So this led to one of the most brutal and stomach turning repressions in history. And this was a repression so brutal that many British state papers on it still remain secret documents. Uh, those who suffered under the British response have released stories of their treatment. So in one article, Naomi, who suffered at the hands of the British, said that she arrived in a camp and could hear others being tortured. She was blindfolded and could hear her children shouting for her, but she never saw them again. She had a bottle pushed into her vagina and she passed out. 
Another victim talks of how his legs were trampled on and says, then I was forced to lie on my back. My groins were taken. Then they used pliers and I felt a very painful yank to my testicles. And this is his memory of being castrated. Harvard historian Caroline Elkins estimated that between 160 and 320,000 Kenyans were taken to detention camps. And she says up to 1.5 million were forcibly kept in either the camps or what they call protected villages. So out of this horrific period, the British got what they wanted. They put Jomo Kenyatta into power, who was essentially a puppet of the, Br of the British in India. He allowed Britain to continue its financial domination over the country. Across the whole continent of Africa, the post-war period marked country after country gaining legal independence. In many of these countries, this took the form of revolutions which aimed to nationalize industry under workers' control. And in these countries, these revolutions were violently stamped out by the imperialists. But across the entirety of Africa, colonization had created a very one-sided economies, uh, producing a lot of a specific thing with no variety. And this meant that under capitalism, these African nations, they could not be free from imperialism, um, from economically stronger countries. Um, they didn't have the development, they didn't have the, uh, the, the breadth of industry to be able to exist on their own two feet. Uh, Thomas Sankara, the famous African revolutionary, made this point very well, I think. When he said these two things, he said, some people ask, but where is imperialism? Imperialism, look into your dishes when you eat. The imported seeds of rice, corn, miele, that's imperialism. And he also said, debt's origins come from colonialism's origins. Those who lend us money are those who had colonized us before. So Sankara here is referring to the imperialism of the French, but these words ring exactly true when it comes to British imperialism. Thanks. As the British were removed from Africa, they did not leave a state of affairs which allowed their former colonies to flourish. African nations had to import in order to keep themselves afloat, which led to crippling debt owed to imperialist nations. Direct rule may have ended but being crushed under the weight of large worldwide imperialist powers was still very much the reality for ex-British colonies in Africa. So throughout this talk, I have alluded to some struggles against British imperialism. People who have been colonized, whether by the British or any other force, have not just accepted this passively. Part and parcel of colonization and imperialism has been the struggle against it. As Marxists, we have a very clear answer on not just why this brutal oppression arises, but on how to fight against it. Marxists understand, as is made clear uh, in the history that I have laid out, that imperialism arises entirely out of the needs of capitalism to spread its markets as far and wide as possible. Therefore, capitalism cannot be separated from imperialism and the fight against imperialism cannot be separated from the fight against capitalism. Throughout the history of anti-imperialist struggles, it can be seen very clearly that anything less than a full wiping out of capitalism will not allow for real national freedom, let alone genuine freedom against oppression and exploitation of the masses. This is proven unequivocally today in Africa, India and the Caribbean where the end of British rule has only led to financial rule by other imperialist forces. Uh, and of course, the continuation, and uh, continuation of exploitation and oppression for the workers. Uh, yesterday, comrades uh, attended a discussion on the scrambling over the exploitation of West Africa occurring today. So therefore, we must understand that the Marxist method to fighting imperialism is to fight capitalism internationally. It is the job of Marxists to show the working class this, that the bourgeois nationalists want only to fight for their ability to exploit you, unimpeded by the imperialists. The working class can only rely on its own forces. Despite what the Tories may say, it is clear to anybody with eyes that Britain has been reduced to a husk of its former self. The empire has been thoroughly hollowed out and the once great Tories are relegated to a position of yapping lapdogs of American imperialism. But imperialism itself is far from dead. So the question we must ask ourselves 
is what can communists do today? We are sitting now in a country whose ruling class grew rich from these horrible events. The effects of British imperialism can still be seen today. There is, of course, a talk happening about Palestine right now, which is a, an effect of British imperialism. <clears throat> For hundreds of years, this city that we are in right now was the home to discussions by the ruling class on how to carry out these horrors that I have laid out. So today we must continue the opposite, discussion on how to throw imperialism into the dustbin of history. Some on the left say that socialist revolution can, can't occur inside Britain because of Britain's history. You know, that the British workers, they've been bourgeoisified off the back of imperialism. And whilst it is certainly true to say that class, con class conflict at home was resolved by uh, the ruling class using the spoils of imperialism, it is clear to me that empire has only kept down the British working class. From Irish immigration in the Industrial Revolution to the arrival of Windrush, it has lowered wages and it has pointed fingers away from the real enemy. So today it is clear that Britain has followed the biblical maxim that the first shall be last. And the standard of living in Britain has plummeted. Real wages are the lowest since the Napoleonic era. People hate the Tories thoroughly. And many people, especially young people, are realizing the propaganda and lies that surround the British Empire. Workers and youth seeing through this propaganda is no secondary question. The ruling class relies on passivity of workers, which is quickly disappearing. And we as communists should take up these questions. We should say to these workers and youth, angry at the history of the British Empire, Yes, you are correct to be angry. Britain has played a violent and bloody role in the history of capitalism. But we should go further than this. We should explain why Britain acted in this way. That empire was not a choice made by bloodthirsty imperialists, but the very logic of capitalism. And through this, we must show these people, uh, feeling this anger, that the only way out, to the only way to end this brutal oppression of imperialism which still exists now, is to build a force capable of wiping capitalism off the face of the planet once and for all. When the Russian Revolution was successful, this presented a beacon of hope for the oppressed and the exploited internationally. Spontaneous revolutionary movements in colonized countries emerged. Parties following the words of Marx, Engels, Lenin and Trotsky were created, full of young people who had been given a new hope. When Bhagat Singh, Indian revolutionary, was executed at the age of 23 for his ideas, he went to his death reading Lenin's The State and the Revolution. Chen Dishao began to build the Chinese Communist Party, a force with the intention of fighting British and Japanese imperialism, as well as class relations as a whole in China. Across the world, the Bolsheviks showed a way forward to those wanting to fight all of the horrors of capitalism. This is our role today, to build up a revolutionary force strong enough to overthrow capitalism in Britain, to send a signal to all those exploited and oppressed by the British or any other imperialist, to throw into the dustbin of history the descendants of those who made untold wealth plundering the world, who still rule us today, and to rid the world of the lies and the propaganda around the British Empire, that is what communists in Britain are required to do today. That's all for this week's episode, so thanks for listening. But before you go, if you're interested in learning more about the lessons from the struggle to overthrow British imperialism, then get yourself a copy of Trotsky's writings on Britain, which cover the decline and fall of the empire, the general strike, and the experienced strategy and tactics drawn from the struggle to build a Bolshevik organization in Britain. Get your copy from Well Read Books today. It's required reading for any revolutionary communist building in Britain. Secondly, the founding Congress of the Revolutionary Communist Party is this weekend. If you don't have a ticket, you're going to miss out on a historic event because in the context of an unprecedented crisis for British and world capitalism, amidst imperialist genocide and climate cataclysm, the revolutionary organization preparing the forces of communism is striding forwards and is boldly planting the red banner to rally class fighters from up and down the country. And it's not only in Britain. This summer, we'll be founding the Revolutionary Communist International, 
during the World School, which will consist of wall-to-wall -wall talks on all of the burning questions of the revolutionary movement. So, go to communist.red to get involved in building your party in Britain, and go to schoolofcommunism.com to sign up to the World School and the Founding Conference. Link to all of this in the show notes down below. That's all for this week, but we'll be back soon with another episode of Marxist Voice, podcast of the revolutionary communists in Britain.